Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. There's a great scene in The Big Bang Theory. I'm thinking of the sitcom, not the scenario for the cosmological origin of the universe. But in The Big Bang Theory, they have a scene where they're trying to dramatize theoretical physicists doing their work. Now, the problem is theoretical physicists just sort of often stand in front of a blackboard silently thinking. So that's exactly what they show in the sitcom, but they play Eye of the Tiger in the background to make it seem very, very dramatic. And then there's some cuts from different angles and so forth. The joke, of course, is that the work of theoretical physics or doing math or related things is just not very cinematic. It does not lend itself very well to being shown on the screen. But that is a challenge undertaken by today's guest, David Goyer. I'm sure you know David's work. He is a screenwriter, storyteller, a novelist, comic book writer who has been involved in things like the Dark Knight trilogy, uh, Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, Blade, Terminator, as well as being the co-writer for video games like the Call of Duty series and so forth. And his most recent project, ongoing right now, is a multi-season adaptation of Isaac Asimov's Foundation Stories, which is currently being shown on Apple TV. So for those of you who don't know, the Foundation series started back in the 1940s. It's the story of the fall of the Galactic Empire. I think one of the first stories involving a galactic empire, although there have obviously been other ones since then. And the conceit is that a future mathematician named Harry Seldon has invented a way to use math to basically predict the future of large-scale civilizations. The idea being that just like you can ignore the motions of individual molecules, if you want to predict the motions of a fluid, you can ignore the idiosyncrasies of individual humans if you want to predict the future of a society. So the Foundation series, as it was originally written, there's a lot of scenes in there of math being done or talked about or argued about and so forth. And it's almost like given ahead of time what's going to happen. The math will always win. So this is a special challenge for uh, an adapter. And it's a very interesting test case because you should watch the show. I, I personally have seen the first season and I think it's wonderful, but uh, you know your tastes may differ. It, the adaptation is not the same as the book. They take many, many liberties. Let's just put it that way. I consider it to be a separate work that is extremely successful in its own right, but it's very challenging. You got to watch it. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of different stories. And one of the problems with adapting Foundation, the original stories were a collection of stories unrelated to each other in terms of characters or places in the universe. So you have to make that into something that is a little bit of a through line where you can follow characters and everything. I had no idea how they were going to do that, and they pulled that off extremely successfully, as well as making the math exciting and, of course, adding in some sex scenes and some starship battles just to make it cinematic and uh, fun to watch on the screen. So I talked with David both about general challenges of uh, adapting big science fiction stories like this and the specific ways in which science and math come into these kinds of adaptations, where you take them on and learn something from them, and where you have to bend the rules just a little bit for the sake of the story. It's something we all got to do. Uh, occasional reminder, you know, we have a website here for the podcast. You can go to preposterousuniverse.com slash podcast. Every episode has show notes and links, and you can get full transcripts of all the episodes. And of course, we also have a Patreon. If you're interested in supporting Mindscape, you can go to patreon.com slash Sean M. Carroll. That's the way that you can get to ask questions for the Ask Me Anything episodes. And also you get ad-free versions of the podcast. So do that to support Mindscape. Sign up for Apple TV if you haven't already to support Foundation, and let's go. David Goyer, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm a bit. There's a, a little bit of trepidation, uh, not being a scientist <laughs> myself. Um, I'm worried I'm going to uh, tank your signal to noise ratio uh, in terms of quality guests, but we'll see what happens. We love it. You're an expert in your domain. You're a domain expert, as we say. So that's completely <laughs> fair. Um, but so the first obvious question I have to ask is, you know, you've been responsible for telling stories on TV and, and film about 
Batman and Superman and the Terminator and now Asimov's Foundation series, Neil Gaiman's Sandman series. So the obvious question is, how big of a glutton for punishment are you in, in telling these stories that already have huge fan bases with very, very specific uh, requirements and expectations? Well, it's it's funny because um, there's a there's a there's a pithy answer and a serious answer, and I'll, I'll give you both of them. Um, I mean, I've, I'm fortunate enough that I've been doing this uh, quite a long time. I sold my first screenplay when I was 21, and it was made as a film when I was 22. I'm over 50 now, so I've been in the game over 30 years. Mm. And, you know, you we've all heard about 10,000 hours and whatnot. Uh, and I think that the, you know, the, the longer you're in it, um, you want to be challenged more. Sure. And, 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 uh, there's no question that this is something, well, I, I did pass on it in my thirties and then again in my forties foundation. Um, but after having, um, done some trickier adaptations, um, I, I felt I was up for the challenge and I also felt I was mature enough to do it. But the, the other answer in terms of Adaptation. It's funny. I didn't set out to become the guy that adapts tricky mm. properties, but I've sort of become known as that now amongst Hollywood is like, oh, this thing's really hard to crack, get Goyer, <laughs> or we need to reinvent this thing, get Goyer. Um, but the, the other thing that's funny right now is um, all of the uh, TV, um, you know, you're seeing this consolidation now, um, with all the streamers, this vertical integration. Right. And, and one of the things that's sad is increasingly as everyone's fighting for a slice of the pie, they're, they're interested in pre-existing IP. So it's harder to sell and set up original projects, particularly expensive ones, because right. they believe that some kind of pre-association means that they have a better chance at, at, at making a profit, frankly. And uh, I mean, of course, I know that's true. And I guess uh, it makes sense to me. But surely they realize that all these pre-existing projects or IPs did start somewhere as non-pre-existing ideas. Uh, well, of course, of course. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense because then you'll get uh, an, an original, um, you know, film or you know television yeah no i, I mean it, it's I, I think it's kind of circular reasoning right. frankly but um you know this is what they tell themselves and i can just tell you anecdotally trying to set up an original yeah. now is yeah. much more difficult than when i began and, and that's too bad but i mean on the other hand maybe there's just a more complicated ecosystem where we field test things in graphic novels or just regular novels to see get some of the kinks worked out before we spend $200 the million. Farm, the farm team. Yeah, of, yeah the minor of, leagues. Of, no, yes, <laughs> yes. It's, it's funny, though, because it can extend to almost, you know, um, ridiculous extremes. For instance, you could have a tiny, tiny comic book that might have sold literally 3,000 copies. But because it's a pre-existing IP, oh, uh, well, well, <laughs> well, gosh darn it, uh, this is a hot property. And then Hollywood's convinced that they can make a billion dollars off of it as a feature film. Interesting to know. For any of the, I always like to, you know, give our audience little tidbits. So if there's any, you know, young film producers or screenwriters out there, that, that is definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, why don't you tell us, why don't you set up for the folks who are not fans of Isaac Asimov's classic series of novels? You know, what is Foundation? What, why is this an important uh, story to tell? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, with a larger audience, I think this slice of uh, our audience that are people who are not fans who have not read the books is is quite large. Mm. Uh, but I think in terms of your listeners, I, I would <laughs> venture that most of your listeners have actually very read possible. it. So, so the, you know, the pyramid's inverted. Foundation started as a series of short stories written by Isaac Asimov um, uh, for uh, Astounding Science Fiction in the late 40s and early 50s. Asimov was a very young writer trying to just break into the game. I, I think it was in his early 20s when he was writing the first um, short stories. Eventually, the first six stories were collected into uh, a novel. And the premise is he was he was interested in the, uh, the law of mass action. He was interested, uh, he was studying the, uh, well, he was always an avid fan of history, but he was just 
um, interested in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, or reading mm-hmm. Gibbons. Um, and, and he was fascinated with the concept of um, statistics, that if given a large enough sample size, um, one could predict the broad movements of history, social science. And so the premise is, you know, X amount of thousands of years in the future, there's a galactic civilization, a galactic empire. And one mathematician, a man named Harry Selden, has come up with a, a predictive model called psychohistory, which does just that. It predicts the broad movements of history. It can't predict the individual person's lifeline or action, but it can predict the broad movements of history. And he predicts that the empire is going to fall and fall quickly. And he can't do anything. Uh, the, em- it, it, the empire is too far gone. Right. Uh, some would obviously make, you know, um, analogies to <laughs> what's happening analogies? today in terms yes. of climate change. Uh, but um, so he can't stop it. No one can stop it. Uh, and if we do nothing, uh, humanity will fall into 35,000 years of chaos. However, if we follow his plan, we can shorten the age of darkness to a thousand years. And, and, um, the first short stories are, are anthological. We jump forward, you know, 50, 60, a hundred years in time between characters. And by the time, uh, these became popular, it's, he settled in progressively into a series of novels and and uh, but it's interesting because Asimov himself never made it to the end of the thousand years. He wrote an original trilogy. I believe the third book was published in 1952. In the 80s, uh, people asked him to write some more. He wrote two sequels. He couldn't figure out how to end the damn thing. So he went back and wrote two prequels and then yeah. he passed away. I think he only got about 578 years into the thousand years. <laughs> um, so the 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 the, uh, the future is yet unwritten. I'm a big fan of you know the original trilogy. I have to say, you know, just being extremely candid here. The prequels, man, I just did not like very much. I thought that he he had become so facile with writing that the original stories, you know, you know, as you say yourself, like the fall of the Galactic Empire is a few sentences, whereas in the later books, it's like every coffee shop conversation is 5,000 words. So there's got to be some happy medium in there. Yeah, you know, it's funny. The the other thing that he did, Asimov, was he he sort of retroactively uh, in the prequels decided to tie the Foundation universe, the Foundation books, into the iRobot universe. Right. The, the the iRobot universe was not part of Foundation, and he kind of retroactively tried to create some kind of grand unified Asimovian you know field theory where he tied a lot of his works <laughs> together. Um, it, it depends. I mean, there are there are people that like the original trilogy. There are people that adore the prequels and sequels as well. You are not alone mm-hmm. amongst, um, in fact, some fairly famous literati who I will not name who, who love the original trilogy but don't like the prequels and sequels. Um, I think I think there are elements in the prequels and sequels that are interesting, and in fact, for this particular adaptation we pulled some characters from the prequels into the present. So it was sort of a mix and match. And did you ever meet Asimov? No, I didn't. He he passed away in the mid eighties, ironically of AIDS, uh, as a result of a blood transfusion, never met him. Um, would have loved to have met him. Uh, got to meet Ray Bradbury a couple of times. That's cool. Uh, So, uh, I, I sort of hold him in the same regard. Uh, never Asimov. Um, but uh, his daughter, who's the in charge of the Asimov estate, is an executive producer on the show, and um, we liaise quite frequently. And, and of course, I had to, I had to um, pitch the my adaptation to her and run various things by her. So she's as close as I've gotten. I did actually get to meet uh, Asimov a couple times. He was a hilariously funny guy. He was a raconteur. Wow. You know, he was well into his uh, grand old man stage, right? And, and he was a lot of fun to talk to. But, you know, as you mentioned, back when he was writing the original, uh, it was a trilogy first, um, it was a series of stories. And furthermore, it was disconnected stories. It was not even the same yeah. characters in the different stories. So 
obviously uh, there's challenges here in ad- adapting it. And I'll, I'll be very, very honest. I've seen the first season. And when I heard that it was being adapted, I wondered how I would do it. And I was like, nope, I couldn't do it. <laughs> it would have to be different characters <laughs> in every episode. It's just impossible. And you, so you, but you did not, that did not stop you. You've really uh, invented a number of clever ways to make it seem like a connected story. Well, it's it, if you read interviews with Asimov, uh, like I said, originally, he was just throwing anything against the wall that would stick. He was trying to make his way as a writer. Yeah. Um, and so he pitched this idea for the um, for the first Foundation story. He didn't know if it would work or not. And eventually mm-hmm. it worked. And and his editor, Campbell, said, well, why don't you do another one? He wrote another one. But he, he didn't go into it planning it as if it were going to be some kind of you know, unified series. Perhaps if someone had said, here's a contract to write a novel yeah. uh, at the beginning, he might have constructed, well, in fact, Asimov said he would have constructed a different story. Uh, but but um, he was just making it up as he was going along. As one does. And uh, it was only by the time he got to the third novel. Yeah, yeah. It was only by the time that he got to the third novel that that it was actually written as a novel. In fact, the second novel is, are, are, are two disconnected novelettes but um yeah that was the there were two primary issues three primary issues one the books are fascinating but they're dry uh uh, almost all the action happens off screen uh the empire falls off screen um (laughs) they're not uh there aren't any character arcs certainly in the first two books that you know the characters don't grow and change um, and that's difficult when you're doing a television adaptation. Um, and as you said, uh, in the short stories, um, Selver Hardin is in two stories, but beyond that doesn't exist. Harry is in the first story and then exists as a recording in a couple of the subsequent stories. And there's, there's no continuity beyond that. Um, and, um, so it was, you know, how do we address all those, those things? Also the fact that, you know, Foundation was an influence, obviously, on Lucas for Star Wars. It was yeah. an, an influence on Herbert for Dune. And so some of these ideas have already been strip mined. Uh, and, and, um, and so the idea of a galactic empire is not something new. When people think of it, uh, the, the general audience, they think of Star Wars. So we had to also figure out ways to make what was old new again or seemed fresh. Um, but what I think one of the things that you're alluding to in terms of the adaptation, which was the key for me was how do I take Asimov's themes and, and express them through character? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so we had this notion of uh, a galactic empire that was resistant to change that um, its fall is predicted. There's nothing they can, that they can do about it. I wanted the empire to be embodied in a character, which it's not in the books, or at least in the original trilogy, it's not. And um, I thought, okay, well, how do I come up with an embodiment of empire that's resistant to change? And that led me to the idea of the genetic dynasty, which is a concept that's not in the books. And it's the idea that this one character, Cleon the First, about 400 years prior to the pilot, decides to keep cloning himself over and over again. And at any one time, there's three of him on the throne. It's the triple throne. There's one of him as a 30-year-old man, and one as a 60-year-old man, and one as a 90-year-old man. And the younger one, Brother Dawn, is an emperor in training. Uh, the middle one, Brother Day, is 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 the ruling emperor. And um, Brother Dusk, the older one, is the, the sort of um, advisor, the consigliere. And, and I thought, wow, what could be, you know, a better expression of being resistant to change than literally trying to clone yourself <laughs> over and over again and pose your ego, yeah. one man across an entire galaxy. And so, and at the same time, it allowed me to cast three characters that we could make a deal with that would appear in episodes after episodes. Right. And, but then, so that started from a place of necessity and then it led to these, you know, oddly, I think for the audience to feel empathy for these monsters. Um, It led us to tell all these interesting stories about nature versus nurture, because even though they're ostensibly monsters, 
they're also tragic. They're all desperately trying to individuate, and they're they're living in the shadow of Cleon the uh, First of, of you know this great man. Um, so that was um, that was the key. And then I said, well, how can I sort of apply that process to other ideas and you know to other themes? Your home isn't just a place to exist. It's an extension of who you are. And Joybird can help you create a space that reflects your personality with modern, customizable furniture. And now, Joybird's sleep-in sale is here. At Joybird, ordering furniture online has never been easier or more fun. You can choose from over 18,000 customization options or browse curated collections to find the perfect piece for your one-of-a-kind style. Joybird is committed to creating quality furniture and a more sustainable future. Each piece is made with incredible care, using responsibly sourced materials free of harmful chemicals. Through partnerships with groups like One Tree Planted, Joybird is helping conserve and restore Earth's most precious natural resources. Quality craftsmanship, stain and scratch resistant fabrics, and limited lifetime warranty. Joybird furniture can handle anything your family throws at it, literally. And Joybird stands by its quality and craftsmanship. You get 90-day returns. If it's not everything you hoped for, send it back. So create a space that brings you joy with Joybird. Visit joybird.com slash Mindscape and get 30% off your purchase. That's 30% off at J-O-Y-B-I-R-D dot com slash Mindscape. So I actually also saw, by contrast, Dune the other night, another big major adaptation that just came out. And it's interesting because I think Dune is in, like most adaptations of these sprawling works, the question is, what do you leave out? Whereas here with Foundation, you have a a pretty sprawling work to start with, but you're adding things to it. I mean, that must be a different challenge. You have to sort of think about the themes and being true to the original material in a different way. It's, yeah, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, twice prior to this, people that were attempting to attempt foundation were attempting to do it as a movie or series of movies. And when mm-hmm. I was approached in my 30s to adapt it, I was approached by Bob Shea, who was running New Line, who'd done The Lord of the Rings, uh, had produced The Lord of the Rings films. And he wanted to do something similar with Foundation. He wanted to make a trilogy of films uh, adapting it. And he approached me and said, come on, it worked with Lord of the Rings. Uh, And ironically, (laughs) even in three films, they had to condense some things and cut some characters out. And I said, I don't think it can work with Foundation as a series of films. I think there's too much that you have to condense and too much uh, that you would have to leave out. And it wasn't until the advent of these big novelistic streaming shows like game of thrones that i thought oh maybe Mm. maybe this could work because now instead of trying to figure out how we can do it in nine hours you know three three hour movies in success maybe i can figure out how to adapt it over the course of 50 hours or 60 hours or more yeah and you are aiming everyone knows it you're aiming for how many seasons Ideally. I am I am aiming for eight. Doesn't mean we'll get there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, doesn't mean I'll change my mind or I'll say I give up. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it was such a big gamble on behalf of Skydance and Apple that they wanted to know that I was writing towards something, that we were writing towards something, that I wasn't just vamping. So I did have to take them through about an hour or so broad strokes of in success where the story would go and and where would it go given that Asimov himself didn't finish it. Right, right. And when you are adding these things, I mean, cloning the emperor, I think is a wonderful idea. And also we can imagine that's something that Asimov would have done if he had thought that and, you know, been in that, uh, uh, trying to do something like that. I mean, how well, much- Well, that's of- just it. That's just it. I mean, I mean, I mean, nanotechnology, this kind of cloning, uh, uh, I mean, that, that, wasn't something that was being talked about or even possible in 1948. And I imagine if you were writing it now, he would have, uh, you know, um, embraced science fiction concepts like that. So I guess that's my question. Are you literally trying to put yourself into the mind of Isaac Asimov when you add these things? Or is it just that you're saying, well, here are the themes we're trying to get across that come from Asimov's book. Let's just see how we can fill in the story to make that happen. I would say it's a little of both. When when I'm adapting something, what I try to do is I try to identify the core elements or concepts that make uh, 
um, the property, you know, unique that, 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 that make foundation foundation. Right. And, and, um, in the, if, if the author or originator of it is still alive, I'll, I'll bounce those off of him or her. In this case, I bounced them off of, um, Robin. And I said, here are the things that I think make foundation foundation. Uh, and, and as long as we, if we agree, then a, we're, um, uh, you know, it, it's like we're eight, we're each, at least we're, we're agreeing that we're each accepting the same model of reality, right? Or, <laughs> yes. or the same, you know, we're the same model of the universe. If we don't agree, then there's, then there's trouble. But in this case, uh, Robin uh, and the estate felt that, yes, it seems like you've nailed the fundamental concepts. And then I said, okay, well, here are some things uh, given. It, it, well, that's the other challenge, right? The other challenge is when, when Foundation came out 70 years ago, the audience was completely different, yeah. much less the world was completely different. So he was using science fiction as this kind of social allegory. And he was the empire. Yes, he was basing foundation on the, you know, uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But the empire that he was interrogating with his metaphors was a post World War II uh, environment. It was, you know, the empires that were falling with the realignment of of Europe, the ascension of America, the ascension of the Soviets, things like that. That's that's what he was writing about. Well, that's a that's not the world that we live in today. Um, <laughs> so I had to think about well, what are empires that are falling today, and that leads you to everything that's happening. I, I'm not saying it's political, but the rise of nationalism, climate change, uh, the Me Too movement things like that. Um, I mean, that's just, we're watching a big realignment right now. And, um, you know, the old guard is being challenged. But the, the but the other thing is that the audience has changed, right? So the audience that were reading his original stories in astounding science fiction were largely men, largely mm -hmm. white men. Mm -hmm. uh, the field of science fiction was almost entirely dominated by white men. And, um, you know, even if you you looked at the original stories, you know, uh, that were being written by Asimov and himself, there were, there were all, there were virtually no female characters whatsoever in the first foundation book. Right. I'm not even sure that there were any speaking female characters. So it seems obvious now, but, 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 you know, that, that the audience consuming this is much more varied than the audience that was consuming foundation when it came out. And it seemed insane to me that, especially because we're <clears throat> we're contemplating a galactic empire that exists 25,000 years from now that the that the uh, the characters in the show wouldn't be reflective of the audience that was consuming it. Do you know that famous clip of Carl Sagan on uh, the Johnny Carson show complaining about Star Wars being all white men <laughs> back yes, in the 70s? Yes. <laughs> well, and I, and it, that strikes uh, close to home because Carl Sagan is my um, wife's um, uh, was my wife's godfather. Hmm. So, wow. so there's a, there's a connection there. Uh, uh, Annie Drurian is, is, is my wife's godmother. So, oh, okay, uh, cool. Yeah. I, and, and Asimov himself <clears throat> talked about that later in life in some of the subsequent yeah. books, he introduced more uh, female characters, but you have some purists that are extremely upset that we dared to gender flip uh, some of the characters that we, you know, they're accusing us of, of doing a woke adaptation of the book. I, I tend to think that, you know, this is getting off topic, but that's okay. Uh, I tend to think that people are just out there waiting for things to be adapted so they can express their outrage that it is varied in some way from the original thing. It's become just a tool in the culture wars rather than a legitimate, honest reaction sometimes. I, I don't disagree, but also, I mean, we live in a time of outrage culture. Yeah, I people. mean, that's everything <laughs> that social media is stoking. It's out, outrage is the coin of the realm. Uh, I mean, we know now between with Twitter and, 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 and Facebook that negative posts gain more traction. Uh, we do. so we it's, do. it's, uh, we're, uh, you know, this is the era of outrage and I hope we survive it. Well, this is why I, I'm I'm very happy to be a pretty successful but never absolutely top podcaster because I am not trying to stoke outrage uh, with the episodes here. There's there's better ways to go, and 
Speaking of which, uh, there's an obvious uh, issue that raises itself when you ad adapt Foundation. Not only that it's a sprawling story mm -hmm. and the characters are different in every part, but there's a lot of science and math. There are a lot of scenes where there are people sitting around a table talking about math. That does not lend itself immediately to the kind of cinematic spectacle we're used to now. So how did you think about that challenge? It's true. It's, uh, you know, solving math problems or debating statistics are not particularly cinematic or, or not particularly dramatic. Um, and, and I know that the diehard fans are a lot of people that are, um, you know, either scientists themselves or familiar with science. And, uh, do, do you know the phrase uncanny Valley? I do. Uh, it, when dealing with, you know, um, I mean, I first heard of it. I'm not, I don't know if it originated here with, with animation, with computer animation. Yeah. And so I don't know, you know, the idea being, you know, when, when Zemeckis was doing things like Polar Express or Beowulf, these motion capture um, uh, animated films, uh, the, the animation was getting good enough that it was almost realistic or yeah. but 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 there was something about it that was uncanny that that creeped people out and so they decided that a lot of people decided that better to do a, a more stylized kind of animation that you can actually invest in the characters more easily than sort of reaching you know 99 percent realistic somehow is worse than 70 percent right. realistic so anyway when dealing with science and math and things like that in a show, um, I call it, you know, almost the, the uncanny valley of, of adapting science, which is to say that you, you, I appreciate science. Uh, uh, <laughs> I read a lot of science magazines and articles and books, and I, I listen to your podcast. I listen to other science podcasts, and I'm always trying to work more scientific accuracy into my work and for in fact i work with a uh, organization called the science exchange um which is attempting to do just that uh with the national academy of sciences which is partnering uh filmmakers with scientists and trying to um get more scientific accuracy in these depictions well i know it and, well I, I, while we're speaking of our wives my wife jennifer willett was the founding director of the science entertainment well, exchange well there you go oh my god <laughs> i didn't even realize that okay so i i i okay i i have to go off into a tangent for one Please. second which is I, I went to one of these first um uh mixers i guess and one of the things that was really remarkable is you know there were maybe 10 or 20 of us uh creators that were partnered with various, um, experts in their fields and, and the creators that were there, we all just thought we're, you know, a bunch of knuckleheads listening to these incredibly passionate and brilliant people talk about, uh, their work. They were doing presentations on their work and, and, you know, at, at one of the mixers, we're all having a couple of drinks, at, uh, you know, uh, in and us and, 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 we were saying, why are, why are you here? You scientists, <laughs> you know, you guys are legitimate. You guys are saving the world. Yeah. And to a person, one of the things that they said was because the reason I got into science was because of star Wars or star Trek or, and, and I, and, and the little light bulb went off on all of our heads and we said, wow, there's, there's a service then that we can provide. And it's not even like star Wars was even remotely accurate or star sure. Trek yeah. wasn't that accurate either. Anyway, uh, and 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 that that sometimes gives me some hope, and maybe we're inspiring, you know, a few random young people to get into science. If if, if we were able to do that with you know foundation, then that in and of itself made it worthwhile. Anyway, back to the uncanny valley. So, I'm trying to work math and science into this. I've got some science advisors on the show. Uh, uh, Kevin Hand, you know, who works at JPL and NASA is on the show. Previous He's helping podcast us. guest. Oh, oh, okay. I, I need to look up his episode. So love Kevin. Uh, got a, had a couple other um, mathematicians advising us. And um, it's tricky because it is. It's not like there aren't moments, you know, when where we've depicted something where I know it isn't exactly accurate. I, I'm aware that it isn't exactly accurate because I've had my science advisors tell me that it isn't. 
The problem <laughs> is sometimes the exactly accurate way of doing it is just boring or right. it just boring it, 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 when you're depicting it on screen. Right. And, and then we will have these other drafts where, you know, in, in, in episode five, we got this scene where she's one of the characters, Gail is trying to use optical navigation to sort of figure her way out of this um, problem. And, and I understand that in and of itself, that's a relatively simple thing, you know, that's, you know, discussed, you know, in, in terms of, of navigation, but it's not for the mainstream audience. Yeah. And so what we depicted was an incredibly dumbed down version <laughs> uh, of it. And I knew we were depicting it. And even so, um, you know, the, the various stakeholders in the show were saying, can you trim it down? Can you cut it back? Can you cut it back? And I knew that that was the most dumbed down right. version possible. And so, you know, it's that's what I call the uncanny valley is where you, you, you know, or we can get into we're we're traveling from star to star, you know, planetary system to planetary system. And I'm aware of the fact that, you know, these ships would have to travel faster than the speed of light and we would get into issues of relativity. But um, at a certain point, you just have to kind of hand wave it <laughs> and say, you know, that being said, I do, I do want to correct myself. Uh, in, in one podcast, someone said, how long did it take for the slow ship, which is this ship that um, Harry and his, uh, people take to terminus and we've said that Trantor is in the center of the galaxy and if i remember correctly isn't the galaxy about 106 light years across or something like that oh no it's thousands or thousands of light years really oh yeah. my god well Sorry. we got even that wrong anyway <laughs> uh, but so but obviously the what they call the slow ship it's supposed to take five years to get from the center of the galaxy to the edge of the galaxy and and the only way that the slow ship could get from the center of the galaxy to the edge of the galaxy is to travel faster than the speed of light, I believe. Yes. But you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, that one right? is definitely right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that means that the slow ship is traveling faster than the speed of light. Well, what I've said in the show is that only Empire can fold space. Only uh, uh, Empire. So we did have a scene in which... Empire sets up these sort of predetermined jump gates that these slower ships go to and then jump incrementally. Anyway, it got cut out. But on a podcast, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on, a, on another podcast, I said that it was traveling something like half the speed of light and, and a bunch of science people threw up their hands and said, that's wrong, that's wrong. And it is wrong. And I, all I can say is I just flown in from Prague that morning. I was incredibly jet lagged and I got it wrong. You know, I, I'm 100 percent on your side in this one. And I will advise you to never go see a science fiction movie in the company of a bunch of physicists because <laughs> I'm really, sure I'm sure it, because they're just laughing and it takes and away just, from the pleasure. Ridiculous. Yes, yeah. that's right. And, I know. But it, it does raise an interesting story be, uh, or an interesting question, because, I mean, like you say, uh, it has an enormously influential uh, reach these these big movies. I mean, the way I sure. like to say, it, look, if I write a book, uh, I can try to get everything right in my book, and I'll reach if it all goes well, tens of thousands of people, and they will really understand something and learn something about science. But a TV show or a movie uh, will not try to get it exactly right, but will reach millions of people. So you know, there's yeah. a different role for that to play. And 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 I mean, so I I guess you've already answered this in some extent, but I wanted to know, you know, how do you balance the getting it right versus what serves the story. Well, that's, that's just it, right? That's the tightrope you have to walk. I, I mean, foundation is, is already being received by an audience in the millions. Yeah. You know, the show far beyond anyone who's currently read the novels. Right. I mean, you know, that's a tiny, tiny, tiny subset of our audience. And so you ask yourself, well, then, you know, if we if we have to take some artistic liberties, is is it worth it? And I, I would argue, it is. Yeah. It, is it worth it if we can inspire some people to go into science? I would say yes. Is it worth it if we're telling a show that's fundamentally about faith in reason and faith in science in this era? <laughs> I would say yes. It's incredibly worth it. I mean, that's we we need our scientists right now, and this is a show that says it's only through science and reason that the human race is going to survive. I, I think I've told the story before on the podcast, but it, it's so suitable here. I once was doing a consult for a movie, a, 
like many movies, one that never appeared, as, as you're, yeah. I'm sure, very familiar with the, the phenomenon. But uh, they came to uh, my office at Caltech to talk to not only me, but some of my graduate students. And, you know, they wanted all these opinions from my students. And so they said, well, here's a scenario for the movie. And the students are instantly like, no, that would not happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we had to say, well, that's not a helpful response. I mean, you have to, and the light bulb went on for them when I said, what you're being told when you're told the movie script is not a theory of physics. Take it as data. Yes, this happened like it or not and now your right. job as the scientist is to come up with an explanation that makes it all make sense and then they they all got it right and they're like they were having a lot of fun bouncing that around i think that can be the role of the science consultants to really just not say this is right this is wrong but here's how you make the story make sense and that serves the purpose of telling a good story well, well i i i'll give you an example right so there's there's a place in season one no spoilers that that harry selden is from a place called Helicon and um, that ostensibly orbits a dark star, which is, I guess, a black hole or a brown dwarf or something like that. Uh, and, and that ostensibly this world is sort of in an accretion disk and it's, it's not a very hospitable place uh, to have a planet. And in Kevin hand, our, our consultant said, eh, it wouldn't really work. And, and on top, <laughs> on top of it, um, this is a tiny preview of next season, but on top of it, I said, I, I want to, I, I want there to be a moon that's incredibly close to the world. That's so close that they share an atmosphere. And he said, there's no way that would happen <laughs> because the tidal effects of the moon right. would just create these ridiculous sort of, you know, you know, winds. And, and then on top of it, you know, the, the, the radiation and whatnot from the black hole or brown dwarf, it, 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 everyone would have to live underground. There's no way, there's no way, there's no way. But I, I just said, he would said, why do you want it? And I said, well, for all of these visual reasons and it's important metaphorically and it, and it looks interesting and whatnot. But he, he said, well, I suppose if you invoke <laughs> some kind of type two civilization engineering i said well that's great because you know, that. you know the the galactic empire is a type two civilization and so so he said well yeah if you had you know this whole array of satellites on one side they were helping with the gravity and you did this and did that and i said great done <laughs> you know <laughs> we're adding all of those things but but um and it's certainly going to make when we get to season two some really arresting and exotic visuals well, I think that's the right attitude. That's the right strategy for handling science advisors, which is never to take the first no for an answer. You know, just push them on it. And they're like, well, OK, then you could do this. And then often I think that leads you to someplace more interesting because, you know, the sure. real world is made of constraints and drama is all about overcoming obstacles. And science can give you some good obstacles to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. And it certainly led us uh, time and time again into some really interesting um you know, storytelling uh, iterations, you know, we, we did, we have many times changed our story based on the advice we've gotten from our science advisors. In some cases, we've just corrected things in the dialogue, but in other case, cases, it's led us to tell a, a, a more interesting kind of story because constraints in storytelling are fascinating and interesting. Constraints um, can inspire you to take a more creative approach to something and constraints are interesting for the characters to have to navigate their way through absolutely yeah speaking of constraints um along these same lines you know the foundational idea for pardon the pun of the yeah. original stories was psychohistory right yes. um I mean, parenthetically, I, I do think that psychohistory is entirely BS. I don't think that there will ever be something called psychohistory. In fact, I'm writing a book uh, about the physics of democracy where I explain why Asimov was mistaken about that. But, you know, for the purposes of the book, I, th I think it's sure. perfectly fine. Um, how do you or do you just not dramatize uh, sitting around and thinking about math? Is that something that is intrinsically unfilmable or is it just you make it pretty without worrying about explaining it or do you just sort of shift it on to more character-based ideas? All of the above. I mean, one of the first things we did, uh, you've seen the show, is uh, our, our depiction of math, I think, math, I think is incredibly beautiful. And... Um, and I think it's unique in, in terms of filmed entertainment. And 
Um, I remember when we were developing that, we did a lot of look development and um, uh, a visual effects house, a design house called Tendril were the ones that cracked it. But I, I talk a lot when I'm talking to my um, fellow filmmakers and, and department heads and whatnot. I'm a story guy fundamentally. So I, I, I talk in adjectives or I, I, you know, I'll be emotionally descriptive. And I said, I want our depiction of the math to be very beautiful. And I want it to look like the language of angels. That's what I said. What does that mean? I don't know. You figure <laughs> it out and come back to me. Right. Uh, and, and, and I said, you know, I didn't want to use Arabic numerals because that was, I didn't want it to look like the depictions of, of Nash's work in a beautiful mind. I wanted to That's look the obvious comparison. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Something beyond that. And we came up with this um, depiction that's that's you know our it's it's swirling and it's and and it's beautiful and and the math you know swoops and spirals and it's somewhat based on kind of the murmuration of birds or starlings or things like that and and it's it's meant to be beautiful. And godlike, because I often think that that if angels spoke, I'm not particularly religious, they would speak <laughs> in math uh-huh. because it's sort of the code that the universe is based on. And and so that's quite beautiful uh, that when we see the math and the depictions of psychohistory. Um, but then my other way of approaching it or our other way of approaching it was to not talk about the dryness of the predictions, but talk about how the predictions relate to the people in the story. So some people are fearful. Some people are hopeful. Some people believe that the predictions are are being misused or that Harry's become a cult leader. And then there's also this whole idea of are, are, are they predicting a deterministic future, you know, are they depicting a future that can yeah. be changed or that, that can't be changed? Do we have any free will? Does an individual have any agency? That stuff's interesting. Right. right. And, and that's, those are some of the things that we traffic in, in the show and we'll traffic in the show again and again and again is, is the math our salvation is the math our damnation. Are we prisoners of the math? All right, now you got me thinking about this. I got <laughs> these. These are very good questions, um, but also at a, at a stylistic level, you know, as you said about Asimov's original text, uh, not only were the characters all men, and and you know, there was not a lot of ethnic diversity talked about. Whether it was there, I mean, maybe he didn't. Yeah, mention we don't it, so know. We can, I, we can I read it to, in. To my knowledge, most of the characters that the 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 ethnicity ethnicity wasn't wasn't described yeah, it's just not there, in the books, right. but it's implied that it wasn't very diverse. Yeah. But it's also, um, you know, he was not talking, he didn't have a lot of sex scenes, and he didn't even have a lot of uh, action scenes or, or battles or anything like that. And I think once I read an interview with him saying that he didn't have any bad guys, you know, it just he just had, you know, problems that the universe was giving you. So it, that's, yeah. that must be part of your toolbox to add and spice things up a little bit. Well, and in fact, the, the protagonists... Uh, certainly of the, the the first novel and the second novel by and large also don't have any conflict. Mm-hmm. You know, they're fully formed and most of them don't have any doubts. And, <laughs> and, and just when you're watching filmed entertainment, that is simply not interesting. Yeah. I mean, filmed entertainment, it's based on conflict. We want to see pe- people doubt themselves and, and overcome those challenges. We want to see them fail. Um, we want to see soap operas to a certain extent we we want to see people fall in love and fall out of love and betray one another and 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 that that's filmed entertainment uh no one would have made an adaptation of this show that was simply men in a room sort of smugly self-satisfied having (laughs) thought of you know thought of the the answer you know and and then presenting it to other people and and not having any dark night of the dark nights of the soul, no one would have made that show. Uh, uh, and per, and perhaps a tiny, tiny sliver of the audience might have loved that version of the show, but it never would have been made. Well, it's interesting because despite you know my formative science fiction reading years being in the seventies, I read a lot of stuff from the thirties and forties, the pulp era, and it certainly was part and parcel of the style of 
uh, Heinlein and, and Campbell and, and Asimov that they were competent men solving problems. And that's the, what the we... Great men, the great man theory. Yes, very, 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 very much. And, you know, I still like the competent side of things, you know, the competence porn aspect of, a, a, I don't like yeah. my characters being stupid, but that's, I guess that's, I'm putting words into your mouth, but characters can be flawed and make mistakes without being stupid. And that's the kind of thing you're looking for, right? I, by and large, yes. Although, you know, I'm a fan of succession, right? And succession <laughs> uh, has a lot of characters in it that are flawed and stupid. And stupid. <laughs> so, yeah. That's why uh, I'm not a fan. <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant show. Uh, I, have, I have just a question for you. Uh, you know, working in the rarefied uh, field that you do, can you enjoy uh, a, a work of soft science fiction or, you know, just as, a, as an audience member, can you enjoy it? Oh, 100%. Yeah, no, I have no trouble whatsoever uh, violating laws of physics or, or inventing complete fantasy. Uh, the two things that bug me are not making sense. And right. like I said, just total incompetence purely for story reasons. Like this right. person has to be dumb to make this event happen. And like, oh, right, on, right, you just weren't right. working hard enough as, as a writer there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something that I can't remember. Someone might have taught this to me or perhaps I'm remembering it incorrectly. But when it, we're in the writer's room, uh, one of the things that I'll say frequently is and which is not to say that we sometimes we have failed, but that that I hate coincidences that work in the favor of the protagonists. That's just bad storytelling. However, I think coincidences that work in favor of the antagonist and that make it worse for the protagonist, I think are okay. Because okay. you know, I you always want to make it as difficult for your protagonists as possible. And right. so uh, I, I do think an occasional coincidence that works to the favor of the villain is permissible. Yeah, in fact, I think that's exactly right. I'm I'm on board with that. It's the self uh, harm that I that yes, <laughs> that no, I know. Bugs me. But that's I'll give you another I'm... example. Okay, uh, have you seen Breaking Bad? Oh yeah. Okay. Very so, very flawed. Or, or Better Call Saul. Right. Yeah. Both both are incredible incredible shows, and you know Walter White or um, you know Saul Goodman, both in both shows frequently self harm themselves. That's I true. mean, they both trip over themselves and and part of the fun of that i won't say fun but 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 part of the reason i think you you watch those shows you say oh please don't do that please don't do that please don't do that <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that human beings work against their own self-interest all the time no it's true all the it time anyway i'm just i'm just arguing against but, your quibble no i mean i i get it and in fact this is one of the uh, i think that's what stopped uh breaking bad for me one of my all-time favorite shows but on the other hand he was super competent at his yes. domain expertise yes. right you know he was the best chemist around so like when he well, got to that he he could shine one of the things that we're playing around with in the latter half of the season is a preview on foundation um and then in future seasons are are the sort of Yes. I mean, Harry Seldon is the consummate domain expert, um, but he has his shortcomings, yes. <laughs> his personal shortcomings. And we're going to, uh, and, and they're a product of his experience and a product of his, um, <clears throat> his childhood. And we're going to start to explore okay. those. Uh, and, and they do inform his math and they did inform psychohistory. And so uh, but that's interesting as well, and certainly something that that Asimov wasn't interested in exploring. No, we didn't learn a lot, at least in the original series. In, in about, the original, yeah. the original trilogies. Yeah. That's right. Um, so th this all brings up like a bigger picture question. Maybe you have thoughts about this or maybe not, but science fiction of that era, and maybe even today, has a self-image of being the literature of ideas, right? You know, this is yeah. where... Even if you're not trying to, you're not trying. In fact, you're not trying to predict the future, but you're trying to imagine the future in different ways it can be. I mean, how much does uh, a creative person like you take that on board as a duty to sort of be the literature of ideas? I do. I mean, fundamentally, I would say my job as a storyteller is is first, it's that you know, do no harm with storytelling. It has to. Uh, 
be a watchable show. Mm. It, it, it has to be a show that people want to tune in week after week. So that that's my first job, you know, is, is to make people want to keep watching. Uh, selfishly for me, it's because I like working in this medium and, and I'm a big nerd and a big geek. And that means if I can keep watching the show, uh, if I can keep making the show, <laughs> then I have an opportunity to depict black holes in the right. future. I have an opportunity to sort of depict some of these other things like a space elevator falling that I've always, you know, read about and dreamed about depicting. And I, I like doing that stuff. I like telling the kinds of stories that, that can only be told with the kind of boundaries or complications. Uh, yeah, I am interested in, 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 in telling a story about, you know, relativistic time. I, I am interested in, in, in depicting all of these things or figuring out what happens, you know, prior to the big bang or depicting that, you know, on right. the show. Yeah. And so the only way that I can get to do more of that is if the show is successful and a big enough audience watches it. So, but I, I do take it seriously. I do think as the show progresses, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in depicting, um, you know, what are the social politics of the future? What are the gender politics of the future? You know, um, uh, what happens in the future when you can, you know, not just clone people, but, you know, predict, you know, not predict, but assign gender. Perhaps there are three, four, five genders, you know, yeah. that, that, that yeah. we can assign. And so all of that I find interesting. And, and, and so I do think, part of the sort of remit of the show is to get our audience to think about some of these big ideas and some of these big concepts. Well, I know that in the movie business, there's been worry both about the economics of the giant blockbusters and also the prevalence of, you know, comic book movies. Do they even count as cinema as Martin Scorsese has argued and, and so right. forth? Um, and I, the economic worries aside, you know, you've, you've done both the comic book stuff and, and then this science fiction stuff, which is a little bit different. So I guess, uh, do you consider this idea, again, I'm trying to put words in your mouth, I shouldn't do that. One might argue that uh, thinking about the large scale sweep of the future of human history is just as important as talking about someone middle aged and breaking up. <laughs> right. I mean, that's just as human and real and, and dramatically relevant. Um, do, are there worries in your mind or do you even care about uh, does it is it as significant from an artistic point of view to be telling these big space opera stories? I, I understand what you're asking. Um, am I worried that that my little show, our little show, won't be taken as seriously when it comes to, you know, award season? Uh, That's one way of putting it, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I mean, I mean, there tends there historically, there's been kind of a, a, a snootiness um, when it comes to genre, um, both in film and television, historically. Um, science fiction and fantasy are not genres that have been held in high regra regard, at least beyond that sort of what they call the technical awards. But that started to change with Game of Thrones. At the end of the day, no. I mean, I, I, um, I think even in the first season, we get into some pretty heady philosophical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what's interesting for me is that we get into some pretty heady philosophical stuff in a way that and, and I adore Breaking Bad, but in, in, in a way that they never could or would. And I think that's kind of unique right. about our show. And I think people will be surprised when they get to the end of the season at for a show that was based on relatively dry, hard a series of relatively dry, hard science fiction stories. I, my hope is that people will be surprised at just how moved they end up being. Yeah. And, and how thought provoking some of it is. And you said you've seen the first season. So I'm alluding to episode eight, uh, uh -huh. at, which I, I think is pretty intense. Uh, and I would argue <laughs> is in terms of just as existential questions is about as intense as it gets, uh, by the end of that episode. Uh, and, and, you know, we've already written season two and we, part of the fun of season two is we've, gotten through the exposition and there are some extremely uh 
interesting philosophical questions that we get into as existential questions in season two. But but also, even in this season, as the season progresses, we get into the nature of Demerzel, who is a humaniform robot, and whether or not Demerzel is a is a being, uh, whether or not Demerzel has a soul, um, whether or not Demerzel is a machine, or or you know, she it is not biological life form but whether or not she it is a life form um and we get into some of the interesting constraints of of asimov's laws of robotics as well and i i I think we go to some some pretty rarefied philosophical places in this show yeah no that's a very very good answer but you know since i do have you here let me lean on your domain expertise a little bit and talk about the you know the, the what goes into making something like this like first at the most basic level you already alluded to the fact that it could have been done as movies doing a tv show is just a very different thing on the one hand you have a lot more room to work on the other hand something's got to happen every episode like how do you balance that do you think it's more freeing to do the tv show or is it more like demands on you to have so many cliffhangers or twists or what have you both i I will say i started out working almost exclusively in film and over the years i've started to gravitate more and more towards these serialized uh, shows that are happening on the streamers. My personal preference for these days consuming something tends to be long form serialized mm. narrative. Yeah. I, I like digging in and knowing that I could be with characters for multiple seasons. I love the experience of watching game of Thrones and knowing that care, you know, in a movie you can usually have a character change once <laughs> and it happens fairly quickly, right? It yeah. has to happen over the course of two hours or three hours. But, but you know, in a in a fifty or sixty hour or seventy hour uh, serialized show, characters can grow and change and fail. Good people can become bad people. Bad people can become good people. They can screw up multiple times. And and I, I just find that kind of storytelling jazz more interesting right. personally these days. But it does come with its constraints, as you say. Uh, people like their cliffhangers. There's a cadence to the way people consume storytelling uh, these days that comes with its own set of um, assumptions. And and I've been experimenting with not sometimes going with that cadence, you know, in this show. Uh-huh. And, yeah, and sometimes that. people are upset that... <laughs> You know, we'll be with a character for a couple of episodes and then we won't come yep. back to them for a couple of episodes <laughs> or that we'll we'll slow things down and do a short film at the beginning of an episode. And I, that's very deliberate on my part. And um, it's interesting because I think some of that comes from the audience being unconsciously trained by watching things like Game of Thrones, very much. Game of Thrones right. and, which was, I thought, a brilliant show, but wasn't experimenting with the form quite as much as we've been experimenting in season one. Some people love it. Some people don't, but I, I'm, I'm cognizant of that. The other thing that's interesting, um, just in terms of the way it's being consumed, is different. Netflix releases all their shows at once. Right. Uh, HBO Max has been experimenting with re- recently releasing them two at a time or four at a time or something like that. When we started producing this, Apple hadn't even existed as a streamer, and so they hadn't decided how their shows were going to be consumed. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, they decided that they felt that they can create more water cooler moments if the show comes out on a weekly cadence. On one hand, that's infuriating <laughs> to the audience who are used to consu- who are used to right. binging things. Right. And some of our audience have been very angry that the show is that we're daring to release the show on a weekly cadence, but they're talking about it. And so I'm just as a kind of social scientist I'm really interested to see, you know, we just released episode six this uh, weekend. We've got four more this season. I'm really curious to see what the experience of the audience is and how it differs when you're watching it once a week or how an audience will experience our show if they can just binge it once it's, you know, once Thanksgiving is out and they can watch all 10 and new people are coming to it. I'm just really curious to see how what their perception of the story is like and how that changes from consuming it on a weekly cadence? No, I think it's a great question. And I will say, you know, to the listeners out there who are thinking about watching it, um, 
Number one, I, I would my advice would be to come at it as a completely new experience. If you've read the books, you know, don't right. don't try to f shoehorn it into the books, like accept it for what it is, uh, because it, it is a completely different thing. And the other is, you know, I, I actually think and we'll see how this goes, but I think that your season one is like the paradigmatic case of something that would be much better to watch over two nights rather than over 10 yeah, weeks. I, I suspect <laughs> you're probably right. Yeah. And it, it probably works better, you know, two at a time or three at a, you know, three at a time or not. Um, you know, that decision was just above my pay grade. Of course. Uh, so, uh, and people can always it, wait, right? People don't have right, to but, watch it every week. Yeah. But it'll be interesting though. Once, I'm just really curious to see what happens once Thanksgiving hits then over the course of the next three months, because inevitably more people will come to it. They've, they've, been, right. they've been hearing about it and how that changes. And then the question is when we get to season two and our, our audience has been building, you know, does Apple decide to stick to their guns and release it once a week or not? I mean, Game of Thrones was very successful uh, coming out once a week. On the other hand, I think season two will be easier for us as storytellers because a lot of the big exposition, you know, we've gotten over that hurdle right. and, and now we can quote, just tell the story. Yeah. But I do think, uh, again, uh, Apple will do what it does. And it it's, it's certainly beyond my pay grade, if not yours. Um, but your storytelling techniques in this, in the show are more formally inventive than Game of Thrones was. It's a different kind of thing. And it just helps the audience a little bit to, you know, remember sure. what happened from moment to no moment question. you can watch it very I, quickly. I, the other thing that will happen, which is interesting, is season one, the show comes out. So A, from the diehard fans, there's an expectation of what an adaptation of Foundation should or shouldn't be. Yep. Um, after a season's come, by the time we get to a second season, um, we're not dealing with those expectations anymore. Hopefully, we're just dealing with it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and the, the same will be said, you know, prior to the show coming out, a lot of people are saying it's the next Game of Thrones or is it the next Game of Thrones or it's Game of Thrones in space. I understand why they're talking about it, but it's not particularly helpful. Of course, it's not Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, it's not intending to be Game of Thrones. No. But hopefully by the time we get to the second season, you know, nor was Game of Thrones at the beginning. Uh, people were freaked out when Game of Thrones came out yeah. because it, it defied conventional storytelling. There were too many characters. It was a slow burn. People um, died. Yeah, people died. Uh, it, it also broke some of those storytelling conventions. And hopefully by the time we get to season two, uh, they won't be comparing it to Game of Thrones. It will just be Foundation has sort of set this tone and it, it is what it is. And, right. and now they're they're judging it on its own terms. Good. Uh, two questions to wrap up. Um, one is I can't let you go without at least mentioning the Sandman. Like if if foundation wasn't already wickedly difficult to adapt into an episodic tv show it's it would seem to me like sandman is an even bigger challenge is it uh do you do you feel like you've practiced now with foundation and it's going to be easier or are the challenges completely unique uh San, well they are unique they're both long considered unfilmable you know the biggest challenge with sandman is that it it, it doesn't adhere to any one genre uh, it, it, it skips around. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a horror episode. Mm. It's a philosophical episode. It's a fantasy episode. It's a largely, um, historical fiction episode about, you know, I, I don't know, I, I get, you know, um, Shakespeare, you know, and the way that he wrote, uh, his plays, uh, where his inspiration came from. Um, some of them are funny, uh, some of them are farcical, some of them are deeply steeped in, in DC universe, um, mythology. That was always the biggest challenge is it's, it's, it's always been a bit of a feathered fish. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not easily categorizable if I got that word right. Um, in the case of Sandman, uh, the creator is still alive. And it's someone that I've gotten to know, Neil Gaiman, uh, over the years. And it was kind of remarkable because for years I was, it's, it's also something that I felt would benefit from long form storytelling that they were having to cram too much into a feature adaptation, right. but was 
in the case of Sandman, um, I finally convinced Warner Brothers to do it as uh, a big serialized show. And the thing that was remarkable with Sandman is no one had ever thought of making Neil a producer on the show. (laughs) Uh, And I insisted that that be the case and said I wouldn't do it unless Neil was a producer. And then I said, I want Neil to co-write the first episode with me. So, you know, we have that imprimatur. We have that stamp of approval. I suspect when the show comes out, um, it's, it's largely high fantasy. So we're not going to get into issues of whether or not we've screwed up on relativity or things like that, <laughs> but, but it's got its diehard fans. Some of who are already angry that, that oh, yeah. piece of casting doesn't adhere yeah. to their, you know, their preconception of who or what it should be. And, um, I, I suspect largely, um, and similarly to foundation, we had to figure out a way to, cleave to you know the organizing precepts of sandman what makes sandman sandman but a a way to also make it digestible for a large-scale mainstream audience who have not read the source material Uh, and we had to sort of hold both of those um you know against one another i suspect like foundation i hope that you know the mainstream audience will largely like it and and i'm sure there will be some purist for lack of a better word who will be very angry that we dared to collapse these two characters into a single entity or you know uh, the the gender or race of a a, a character doesn't uh, fit with you know the original depiction in the comic books you know i was surprised when i had seth mcfarlane on the podcast that, that he admitted he reads all the comments he is very invested in like what the audience is saying online about his tv and his his movies are, are you that way or do you just try to stay away from all that drama i'm i read some of them i'm not on social media i made a decision a long time ago not to be on social media um I, I know myself and I think I would go down a rabbit hole too quickly. And I also have a very dry sense of humor that doesn't translate well, uh, uh, you know, say no more. Yeah. But, (laughs) but, um, you know, I read some of the comments on Reddit. I did an AMA on Reddit. Um, uh, I, I think it's helpful to know the broad strokes of the audience's reaction, but then, It's also important to remember one of the things that's great about the internet. One of the things that's terrible about the internet is, is every voice, you know, has an equal megaphone, you know, uh, and and there's some incredibly, you know, we all know there's this incredibly toxic and virulent kind of underbelly to the internet. And, and in the case of foundation, there was some incredibly misogynistic and racist things that emerged, you know, with some of the casting. And so, yeah, once you get a sort of smell of that, I have no desire to go down a 4chan <laughs> rabbit hole, you know, uh, you know, on, on on that in that regard. Good. And then the final question is up to you to say how much you want to say about it. But the f- best character in the Foundation series is obviously the mule. Uh, for those who have not read it, we won't give away too much, but like a singular being in the, this universe that Asimov invented. And we haven't met the mule yet, uh, or are we going to need to wait until like season six to meet this character, or is, is the mule coming soon? Uh, well, it's interesting. Also, the mule, I will say, was a character that Asimov created because his editor said, this is boring. <laughs> Uh, you've been telling these stories and, and you know, psycho history predicts that this is going to be outcome and then we'll have a great man say, well, of course, this is what's happening and it's boring. Uh, and so, um, he, you know, to a certain extent, Asimov was listening to his critics, uh, his main critic being Campbell. So he created the idea of the mule, this mutant that was something that psycho history could not predict. Um, and it's exciting because it, 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 it throws the plan into disarray. The mule I liken to uh, a, a scene in Game of Thrones called the Red Wedding that happened in season three. You know, uh, fans of the books really wanted to get to the Red Wedding first. And, <laughs> and, and Benioff and Weiss, who were adapting the book, said, we need to earn the Red Wedding. And so the first thing I said to Apple, they said, is the mule going to be in season one? And I said, no, <laughs> uh, the mule is not going to be in season one. And here's why. I would argue that the mule, the mule happens at the second half of the second book of Foundation. And I think the reason why the mule is so effective is 
because Asimov did that storytelling setup where there was this expectation that the Selden crises would be solved in a certain way and, and that psychohistory would work. And, and, and then this spoiler came in. And I don't think the spoiler would have been as effective if the spoiler had emerged in the first book or in our first season. So the mule will not be showing up in season six. The mule will not be showing up in season one, uh, but somewhere in, somewhere in between the mule will show up. But I will say the mule will and will not show up in the way that the audience is expecting. And I'll, and I'll just give you one fans of the books, something to think about, which is in the books, um, there is a second foundation. It's sort of a surprise. But in the books, the set you meet the second foundation, and they already exist. You know, they're, they've already been created, um, and they're introduced as this sort of, you know, late stage Act Three reveal, almost like a Deus Ex Machina in regard mm-hmm. to the Mule. Well, in our show, um, we don't have the liberty of just introducing the second foundation as a Deus Ex Machina, or rather, that wasn't interesting. So in our show. You know, I'm interested in showing how the second foundation formed. I'm interested in depicting how the mule became the mule. Okay. Very, very interesting. That is something to think about. Because I I do think it's fun to, you know, what, what fans should do is really take seriously how they would adapt their favorite properties sure. and then compare it to what it is. Cause it's really hard. Like you can't just film what's there in the comic book or on the novel. It's, it's a really, it's a, a tremendous amount of well, great effort goes into doing that. Well, in the case of the mule in the books, the mule just suddenly we start, we start one of the novellas and the mule's just a thing and he's already taken over half the galaxy <laughs> and we have no context whatsoever uh, about him. And then the mule <laughs> destroys the empire off screen. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Something to think about. David Goyer, I'm sure you've been doing many, many of these interviews, so we very much appreciate your time. Thanks for being on the Mindscape Podcast. And, and thank you for being very gentle with me with regards to science matters. Science is gentle. That's its, that's its <laughs> motto. <laughs>